Hi, students, and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria, the Garden City of Canada on the West Coast here. I hope everybody is having a great day so far. Looking forward to a nice weekend, staying healthy and productive. Hi, Jaspreet, Ashish, Pama, Panchal. Nice to see many students in the class. Welcome to our moderator, uh, Carolina. In this class, everyone, we are looking at the listening section and we're doing some more practice for band nine. Specifically, we are looking at part three and part four of the listening section. Those are the more challenging parts of uh, the listening. Uh, this is a continuation from yesterday. So we did part one, part two of the listening yesterday. If you missed that class, no worries. That class is up on our channel, so you can check it out after. And you do not need to see that class to do well in this class. So hang around. Uh, Rajdeep Kaur, Rashika and BitCloud30, good to see our members in this class as well. Welcome everyone. Uh, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Please check us out there. And for the general IELTS, please visit us at gieltshelp.com. That's generalieltshelp.com. On both of our websites, uh, we have lots and lots of materials. We have original practice exams, HD videos. Uh, of course, they're linked with apps. I'll show you what these look like real quick while we wait for a few more students. Uh, this is our Academic IELTS website here with the blue background. You can click that big red button to join our premium package. It's a one-time payment for a lifetime access. Again, we are British Council IELTS Registration Center and certified agents. And for the general IELTS, it's the green background. And you can click that big red button uh, to join our premium package. Uh, there, we will use our academic website in just a few moments to get going on the listening. If anybody has questions, just send me an email to adrian at aehelp. Uh, dot com, and I'll be glad to respond to you in due time. Uh, we have a couple more classes tomorrow as well. Um, we'll have some writing for our members, finishing task two, and we will have part three speaking. Okay, uh, so uh, like I said, we started listening uh, yesterday, and uh, one of the strategies I showed you yesterday uh, was to look at the topics of part two, part three, and part four. Um, so yesterday we looked at uh, part one, which was about a student um, worried about her registration status. And then we did part two. That was about a resort, a tour around a resort in Veradero, Cuba, I believe. Um, and uh, we had a sneak peek at the topics of part three and part four. Uh, part three was something about zoos. And then part four will be something about a turtle. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, just some quick review of tips yesterday. Make sure to check transcripts for answers in the listening that you get incorrect, especially. Okay, that's just a reminder. All right, so uh, today's listening, uh, again, is coming from uh, exam four. And uh, if you have access to our books, this is the second exam book in our series. And uh, you can find it there. Um, students, I'm going to be playing the audio uh, through my headset microphone. Uh, so if it's quiet for you, please um, turn up the volume or uh, use a headset, okay? Um, and uh, very importantly, students, please, please, please uh, do not uh, write your answers in the chat. Please try to remember this. I always remind you of this, uh, just so that it's fair for everyone, everybody gets a chance to answer on their own. Put your answers in a separate document or into a separate sheet, okay? All right, um, so again, we'll hop back 
to the website here. I'm just going to go into uh, my student account. And in my student account, I will find my computer-based practice exams, my full online course, study plans, workbook, lesson videos, and I want this one here, which is the IELTS audio CDs. Among the IELTS audio CDs, I will go to CD4 because it is test four. We have lots of audio. And then this will be track number three. So here we go, students, with the listening for exam four, part three. Get ready to listen and answer. Now let me just make sure I have max volume here. Yep, there we go. Okay, max volume here as well. Yep, good to go. Here we are. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College Dublin is an animal conservationist. Welcome to you both. The topic of tonight's discussion is the ethics of zoos. Here is the fundamental question. Is it right to house animals in zoos or should they live freely in nature instead? As an animal rights advocate and theorist, I have clear views on this question. To me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons and should be afforded many of the rights that human beings have. Chief among these is the right to liberty and the freedom to achieve one's desired ends in life. Clearly, these rights are abrogated by imprisonment within the zoo. Moreover, in many cases, animals in zoos are treated inhumanely and are subject to confinement in extremely small spaces. While regulation of zoos may help mitigate some of these problems, I maintain that zoos are fundamentally unethical. I certainly understand Dr. Gergen's position, and I do agree on some of his points, most notably that zoos must be held to higher standards of animal treatment than they are currently. But my colleague fails to consider an important point in favor of zoos. The conservation of species is an incredibly important endeavor, and zoos are on the front line in the battle to save hundreds of species of animals around the world. Zoos often employ some of the leading experts in the field who are best equipped to carry out this important task. It is for this reason that I believe zoos are justified. Though they may not be perfect, I believe zoos and the experts they employ play a critical role in the conservation of species and therefore are ethically permissible. Dr. Gergen, do you have a rebuttal to that point? Yes, certainly. While I appreciated Dr. Mester's position as a conservationist, and I do appreciate the work she and others like her do for animal welfare around the world, I must disagree with her. While zoos certainly do play a role in animal conservation, it is not because they are zoos that they play this role. Dr. Gergen, can you clarify that point for the audience? Of course. What I mean is this. It is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals. The notions are separable. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos, since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. Fair point, but such animal preserves would still have the associated problems of poor treatment and unsuitable living conditions. Yes but at least it would be in an effort towards a positive end. The animals would not be captive forever, and they would not be captive merely for a human audience. 
You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 27 to 30. What about the enjoyment and education that zoos provide, especially to young people? Perhaps individuals like yourselves were inspired to become animal advocates by attending a zoo when you were a child. That is a really interesting point. I was indeed inspired by going to a zoo when I was a child. What do you think, Dr. Gergen? It is an interesting thought. What if the positive outcomes caused by inspiring people like us to do good in the future outweigh the harms done to zoo animals? I'm not sure I would have to think about it more, but it's certainly an interesting question. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. In closing, I'm not sure how much progress we've made, but is it safe to say that we can all agree that zoos, at the very least, must do their best to improve the treatment of animals and the conditions in which the animals live? I would certainly agree with that, as I'm sure my friends would also agree. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, in that half minute, make sure to check your answers. We'll go through them together in just a moment here. Let me stop the audio on the website, and we'll go back to question uh, 21. Okay, um, so here we have a discussion with two experts about zoos. Um, and uh, this is, again, a kind of a typical topic. Sometimes uh, students ask the question, like, wow, is it really that challenging? Um, and uh, yeah, it, it definitely can be. Okay. Um, so here, there were two professors, Dr. Henry Gergen and Dr. Gloria Mesto. When they give you the names like this, pay really careful attention to the names in the questions and the names in the audio so that you match up the correct ideas, okay? That is a really, really important tip. So let me describe this for you uh, in a point. Okay, so uh, this is a tip for your exam. Keep it in mind. Uh, when names are given at the start of a listening part, like in this one, pay careful attention to these names in the questions. and in the audio uh, so that you match the correct person uh, to their opinion, okay? Very common mistake is that students are matching the wrong person with their opinion, so really pay attention to these names, okay? All right, so here we have uh, Dr. Henry Gergen. Uh, is Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh or is Dr. Henry Gergen from Trinity College, Dublin? Um, so Ankush says one should be A, University of Edinburgh, which means that Gloria Mesto must be from Trinity College, right? Um, this was given really, really clearly. And notice how this itself is question 21. So it's not question one and two, it's question 21. So uh, in your computer-based exam, this would likely be a drag and drop. Okay, and uh, in your paper-based exam, you would have just one question here like this, 21, and the way that you would answer this is 1A to B, okay? That's what your answer should look like, and then you'll get it correct, all right? <clears throat> so, 
and pay attention to that, okay? So it's not just about getting the right answer, but it's making sure that you're uh, recording the answer correctly also. All right, so 1A, 2B, very clearly stated by the host. Okay, um, and then here we had questions 22 to 24. So here uh, you have three questions, okay? You have uh, 22, 23, 24. Okay, the order doesn't matter. And when you have these multi, multiple choice kind of questions where you have a list of six and you have three correct answers, okay? Um, what you want to do with this is take some notes, okay? So it's very difficult to catch the answers. Um, and uh, notes that you should have taken here, for example, are persons. Okay, um, wrong, all right, and uh, maybe inhumane. Okay, I'm just going to write inhuman. Um, so those could have been the notes that you uh, took in this part. Uh, which three of the following are arguments given against zoos? Pay really careful attention to that. And this was, of course, Dr. Henry Gergen. Uh, engineer says, I think it was ADF. I'm not sure. Uh, Vishal says ADF as well. Uh, the correct answers were A, B, and F. Okay. Um, the... The person did not say this. They didn't say not be in prison. Okay, so careful not to uh, make your own assumptions here. All right, um, animals are persons. Uh, just a quick question: What does that mean that animals are persons? What do you think the professor means by that? So that one was a little bit tricky because I'm sure some of you are like, "Huh? Animals are persons? Um, what does that? What do you think that means?" In this case, that animals are persons. Can anybody tell me? So again, the correct answers were uh, A, B, and F, and that can be in any order. You can go F, B, A in your answer sheet. It doesn't matter. It would be drag and drop, okay? Honey says they have the same rights. Uh, Nanda said uh, should not be put in the cage. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Shaunak, Sunny, says um, they have feelings, okay? Um, so when, a, when the professor says this, that means they are alive and have feelings, okay? We can infer that that's what the professor uh, means by that. Animals are persons. They are alive and they have feelings. They have emotions just like a human. They can feel stress, anxiety, joy, sadness. So they have their own feelings and their own personalities. Exactly, Vinley. Yeah. So animals are persons, right? They shouldn't be put into a zoo as you wouldn't put a human into a zoo, right? You wouldn't put a person into a zoo especially if they hadn't done anything wrong to deserve being kept in an enclosure. Okay. All right. So ABF, again, uh, take notes, use logic for these types of questions. Okay. Uh, don't try to stare at just the questions because it's really easy to miss one that way. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so here we had uh, questions 25 to 27. It was kind of interesting because this is a bit split uh, between here. You rarely see that, but I have seen that in IELTS exams where they split a question section in, in the listening. Um, so here we go. We need to write no more than two words and or a number for each answer. Okay, uh, number 25, in order to improve the conditions... Uh, for zoo animals, zoos must be held to something of animal treatment. Um, this answer is given by Dr. Maestro, and she really emphasizes this. 
Uh, Kashirsha says higher standards. Yeah, and Kashirsha, these are just common words. It's mid-sentence, so you don't need any capitalization here. You can just simply write higher standards. Okay, so yes, you can give answers in all capital letters. Carolina is giving us the correct answer here, higher standards. Uh, very good. You don't need to capitalize this though, and writing lowercase is faster. Okay, um, standards of animal treatment is not correct. You need higher. So if you don't have the word higher, you're going to get it wrong. Okay, it has to have both of these words, higher standards of animal treatment. Okay, uh, while zoos do conserve animal life, Dr. Gergen argues that this function could also be performed by animal something. This is a collocation. Uh, they say this again and again. They repeat this collocation about five, six times, um, I think. So uh, you have to catch it. Kaldeep says it's animal preserves. Yeah, um, so it is. It's animal preserves. Okay, very good for all of you who got that. Uh, an animal preserve is basically uh, a large area of land uh, that is usually fenced um, and is controlled and supervised where animals can live freely without uh, the public's um, uh, kind of distractions or disruptions. Uh, or without worrying about poachers, so illegal hunting of those animals. So those are animal preserves. They're basically where they preserve, save animals, okay? Uh, again, if you don't catch an answer like that, uh, make sure to go to the transcripts. Uh, the transcripts are the written audio in the back of the book. So uh, with this one here, it's page 115, okay? And when you're studying at home, um, then, uh, you know, you want to um, look at where these answers are coming from. Uh, so you can see here, held to higher standards of animal treatment for number uh, 25. Okay, and then Henry Gergen here uh, says... Uh, animal preserves from zoos themselves. And if you read this, you're going to um, read uh, the idea of animal preserves uh, several times. Here you have animal preserves again, okay? Uh, if you don't know the word, write it down, learn it. If you don't know the collocation, uh, write it down, learn it, okay? All right, back to the questions we go. Okay, uh, after the short break, um, this answer came quite quickly. Uh, even if you missed it, you should be able to guess it from logic. Okay, logic is your friend. Uh, enjoyment and something are two key positive uh, attributes of zoos. I'm sure that many of you who have visited a zoo and looked at um, a tiger or some kind of an interesting bird and then read the plaque, you know what this is. Uh, Kashirsha, Hemanth, and Saswati all say it's education. So enjoyment and education are t two key positive attributes of zoos. Yeah, enjoyment and education, right? It makes sense. So we go to a zoo, we have fun, but if you think about it, schools often go to uh, zoos. Why do teachers take uh, the kids to zoos? Uh, well, not just for the fun of the zoo, but also for the education so the kids can learn about uh, the animals, okay? So enjoyment and education are two key aspects. Uh, Shaunak Sunny says, can't it be preservation as well? No, it can't um, uh, because uh, Sunny, the um, speaker, Dr. Henry Gergen, clearly explains that uh, preservation is not really uh, the responsibility of zoos. That's something zoos do, but that can be done uh, by um, other kinds of facilities, such as an animal preserve. Okay. 
All right, and then we had some multiple choice. Now, for multiple choice in the listening, you really want to uh, focus on the question, not the answers, okay? Uh, this was a fairly easy one because the professor actually says the exact words in the choices. So, according to Dr. Gergen, does the value of inspiring young people outweigh the negative aspects of zoos? The correct answer, Hamanth Edmar. Kashirsha is definitely C. Yeah, he's unsure. Um, he says it. He says, I'm unsure. I'd have to think about that. Right? Okay. Uh, number 29. Uh, what is the interesting question? Now, notice that this is in quotation marks. Uh, when you see those quotation marks, it means that you're going to um, hear that exact phrase in the uh, audio. So you're listening for this, um, and the speaker does say, that's an interesting question. Okay, uh, what's the interesting question? Whether zoos are ethical, whether the inspirational value of zoos outweighs their negative aspects, whether enjoyment and inspiration negate the importance of zoos. A lot of you are saying that should be B, and you're correct. It is B, okay? And I saw a couple people asking, um, is there a specific or a special technique uh, for multiple choice? Yes, there is, okay? And I'll give you a little bit of that right now. So I know it's one of the ones that a lot of people are curious about. So let me give you some tips on multiple choice, okay? So listening uh, section multiple choice question strategy. Okay. Uh, number one, change questions into statements as this is the way you will hear them in the audio. Okay. Um, so here you have a question. What is the interesting question? Uh, you should turn this into a statement. So, um, the interesting question is that, okay, well, there is an interesting question that, so that would be a statement form. Okay. Uh, what do the guests agree on? You're not going to hear this in the audio. You're not going to hear what do the guests agree on. You're going to hear something like, I agree with the fact, okay? So I agree with the fact that, okay? So you have to kind of train or program your mind to change multiple choice questions into statements because you're going to hear a statement 99% of the time and not a question, okay? Um, so you have to kind of synchronize uh, the format of the information. I hope that makes sense, okay? All right, uh, the other step is focus on the question, not the answers, okay? So then I should say statement. So then focus on hearing this statement and do not stare at the uh, questions hoping that the right answer will jump out at you especially since often the answers are paraphrased, okay? So that's kind of the second uh, important point here is a lot of students will just stare at this. And when you have a long answer, like whether the inspirational value of zoos outweighs their negative aspects, um, it's not going to just jump out at you and be like, hey, sirens whirling, wee, 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 I'm the correct answer, uh, pick me. Uh, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is when you hear the answer, oh, that's an interesting question. 
whether the educational value of zoos outweighs um, keeping animals locked up, then you're like, okay, so that's the interesting question. So let's see which one of these matches with that. And then you figure it out, not the other way. Okay. And that's the problem is that students expect that there will be some magical revelation or reveal of the correct answer. And uh, that's just not the way it works, especially because they don't use the exact words. Okay. So sure, you can get lucky sometimes and catch something like this one where he's like, oh, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that's not going to work for most of the multiple choice questions, especially in part three and four. Okay. All right, number 30, um, what do the guests agree on? So the guests agree on the fact that zoo conditions need to be improved, zoos are unethical, the inspirational value of zoos is unethical, um, and Nanda says that one should be A, Hemant agrees, Carolina agrees, that's good. Um, yeah, it should be A. And that leads me to my third and final tip for multiple choice questions, which is logic, okay? So three is use logic. Uh, oftentimes, you can figure out the correct whoa, uh, answer even if you missed the information in the audio, okay? So, in this example, um, what do the guests agree on? Let's say you missed that. You're like, oh, I, I didn't catch that. Uh, well, if I ask you, um, what do you think is the minimum that zoos should provide or should do? Um, then <clears throat> most of us would agree, well, zoos can always be improved. Uh, they can be kept cleaner. The animals can be given larger spaces. Uh, there can be even more real uh, vegetation, trees and shrubs and so on. So we can always, uh, running water, so we can always improve the condition of zoos, keep people a little bit further back, etc. So better conditions, right? It's logical. All right, so that's part three. Now let's get to uh, part four, okay? So part four, we're going to do the same as part three. Uh, I'm going to play the audio if it's quiet for you. Uh, turn up the volume. And uh, there's no break in part four, okay? Uh, we'll look at your scores at the very end. All right. And again, this is coming from uh, our fourth exam. This is gonna be track four for those of you who have access to our premium courses. So uh, let me just uh, jump back here to our website to play the audio. And students, please save your answers uh, for the end. Do not put them in the chat, put them in a separate document, okay? All right, here we go. So listen, everybody, answer, and then we'll go through it together at the end. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a professor discussing the migration of loggerhead turtles. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It's late April on the South Atlantic coast of North America, and one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature is about to begin. The loggerhead turtle, whose natural habitat is the open ocean, has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of Florida provide a perfect nesting spot, with soft sand that can be dug up by the persistent flippers of the female loggerhead. Over the course of the next three months, hundreds of thousands of eggs will be laid on such beaches. 
Many of these eggs will become the victim of predators, but many will survive to hatching, which occurs two months after being laid. Hatching marks the beginning of an incredible journey for the loggerhead turtle. Almost immediately upon hatching, the young turtles, known as hatchlings at this point, head for the open ocean. The ocean, while full of its own dangers and predators, provides a relative safe haven for the hatchlings away from many of the predators that live near the shoreline. These young turtles embark upon a journey that will take them upwards of 13,000 kilometers around the North Atlantic. Many animals make large and incredible journeys, but what makes the loggerhead turtles' migration so notable is the speed at which the animal moves. While many bird species make similar journeys, they move at velocities much faster than the loggerhead turtle. This slow-moving beast travels at the remarkably sluggish pace of only three quarters of a kilometre per hour. This means it will take the turtle a minimum of 17,000 hours to complete its migratory journey not even taking into account stops for feeding and sleep. To put that number in perspective, 17,000 hours is approximately two years of non-stop swimming. That the loggerhead turtle makes this journey alone makes it all the more impressive. From birth to adolescence to adulthood, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary traveler. But how does it know where to go? Doesn't it need a parent to help it know the route? This is where the loggerhead becomes even more fascinating. Recent research tells us the loggerhead uses the magnetic field of the Earth to determine its migration route. Because the Earth's magnetic field differs in each location around the world, the loggerhead turtle can use it as a kind of innate roadmap, illuminating the way to where they need to be. One example of this is the behaviour they exhibit when they encounter the particular magnetic field off the coast of Portugal. Instead of continuing north, towards the cold waters of northern Europe, they sense the magnetic field and turn around, instead heading for the warmer waters of northwestern Africa. And it is not just that the loggerhead turtle has a sort of innate compass. They are able to determine, with surprising precision, their latitude and longitude. They know exactly when to zig and zag to optimise their migratory pattern. Even with their incredible ability to know where they are and where they need to be, the survival rate of migratory loggerhead turtles is incredibly low. In fact, only about one in 4,000 hatchlings makes it back to the beach in eastern Florida to mate and lay its eggs. However, that any make it at all is an incredible achievement and one of the great natural wonders of navigation. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And again, everyone, check your answers in that half minute. Okay, so we'll go through the answers together now. So it's a flow chart for most of these. This is a very typical part four kind of topic and question system. You really have to move with the audio. Um, <clears throat> pay attention to keywords, okay? Uh, let's do this together. So we're talking about the loggerhead turtle which has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of uh, what place? Ashish says uh, Florida. Uh, Hamant says Florida too, but Hamant, it's a small f that you have, so you'd get that wrong. Um, so sandy beaches of Florida, that would be a capital F, okay? All right. So sandy beaches of Florida provide the perfect location for nesting. This also helps you locate your position in the audio, all right? The names of places are very good to identify where the audio is. After hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately heads for the ocean. The ocean is safer than the shore because it has fewer what? So... Uh, this was very clearly emphasized that um, the journey begins as soon as they hatch and with the hatching starts the danger because of predators. Okay, now... Uh, this is a plural, okay? Because of the word fewer, you have to have S, so fewer predators. If you just wrote predator, you'll get it wrong. 
Um, of course, predator is uh, some kind of a living creature uh, which is seeking to uh, attack and eat another creature. The apex uh, predator uh, for our planet is arguably humans because we don't really fear uh, too much out there, but just about every other living creature fears us um, because we attack and eat and kill uh, a lot of the living world, whether animal or plant. And so we are apex predators, unless you believe in Godzilla, and then in that case, Godzilla would be the apex predator. Um, okay, so uh, predator, all right? Uh, the turtles embark on a journey that will take them something kilometers around the Atlantic. So clearly with this word, you realize that you're listening for a number here, okay? And it's just the number. You do not need km or you do not need um, kilometers. You should not write 13,000 with the word thousand, but you should just simply write it as 13,000, okay? So one, three, and just to be on the safe side, you can put a comma there. You don't need to. But the comma helps to separate and identify that it is indeed 13,000, okay? Comma is not necessary, but just so you make sure you don't miss a zero, it might be a good idea. Okay. All right. Um, so, here we go. Uh, while long migratory journeys are fairly commonplace in nature, what makes the loggerhead's journey especially notable is the extremely something pace it travels at. Okay, uh, Ashish says uh, sluggish. That's correct. Um, or slow. Okay. Uh, just make sure that you spell uh, this word uh, correctly. Sluggish <clears throat> is with two G's. It's a heavy G, so slug-ish. Okay. Uh, sluggish or slow. Slow would be okay, too. That might be the easier choice. Both of those are okay. Uh, a slug is a snail without a house. Okay, so that's a slug, and if it has a house, then it's called a snail. If anybody watches SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, you'll know the famous snail, or sea snail, uh, Gary. Um, Gary is a snail. If Gary loses his home, then Gary becomes a sea slug. Okay, so... Uh, and we use that as well in the term sluggish to mean slow because, of course, slugs are, well, they're slow. Even a turtle is speedy compared to that, okay? All right, Saga, good luck on your exam. I know you've been in the classes often, so I'm sure it will go well. Just be confident, okay? All right, um, the entire journey is equal to approximately something of continuous swimming with no breaks. Uh, Anjali says two years. Uh, Ugul Han says two years. Yep, watch your spelling, uh, two years. That's the fastest way to write it. Now, uh, students, in part four, you do want to be fast. So when you can write something fast, write it fast, especially in the paper-based exam, uh, because uh, the information is moving quickly, okay? So wherever you can shorten it up, this is one, two, three, four characters with a dot versus one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, okay? So four versus eight, okay? Twice as much, twice the time, all right? Everybody catch that? That's an important point. So wherever you can shorten, 
uh, definitely do that, especially because in the paper-based exam, computer-based exam will be faster because often typing's faster and oftentimes you're just clicking or dragging and dropping, but the paper-based exam is where you need to be especially careful with this. You have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet, um, so you want to be quick, especially in part four, okay? All right. Very, very important. Okay. All right, everyone. Uh, here we go um, <clears throat> with the remaining questions. Okay. Uh, this is a fill in um, the uh, missing information in the paragraph. So this is kind of like a summary <clears throat> completion. Uh, as, an inc as incredible as the loggerhead turtle's journey is, what makes it even more impressive is that the loggerhead is a something traveler. So here we need some kind of an adjective. And the correct adjective here is solitary or solo. Yeah, solitary. Solitary means that um, the loggerhead travels alone by themselves. So um, lonesome traveler in the great wide Atlantic Ocean. So loggerhead is a solitary traveler traversing the open ocean on its own for years at a time. Uh, scientific research has in recent years told us that it is through a connection with the Earth's something. So this is a noun, okay, the Earth's something, that the turtle finds their way around the ocean. Uh, Edmar Quinones says a magnetic field. Yeah, that's correct. So it's with the Earth's magnetic field that the turtle finds their way around the ocean. Uh, for example, the turtles are able to sense something off the coast of, uh, this is clearly a location here, so it's some place that we're looking for. And hopefully some of you got that. Call Deep says magnetic field for the previous, magnetic field all lowercase, it's a common noun. Apurbo says it's Portugal, and Shakshi agrees, and I agree with the two of you. It is Portugal. Okay, it's off the coast of Portugal. That makes them change their direction and head for northwest Africa. Uh, possessing more than a simple compass, the loggerhead can innately sense it's something and something. Here. So um, it's something and longitude. So these are the lines that <clears throat> kind of uh, run vertical and horizontal on the Earth's surface, uh, imaginary lines. Um, and these are good words to know in English. Uh, Nanda says it's latitude. Yeah, so latitude coming from the word lateral and longitude, okay? So latitude. Longitude, latitude, longitude, okay? These are the lines that go around the planet. Latitude, longitude. The longitude that's at the center of the Earth is called the equator, okay? Uh, Ahab, if you have a question regarding writing, send me an email. I don't want to go off topic. We're in listening right now, but I'll happily answer your questions. Just send me an email. Okay, uh, last question, number 40. Approximately what percentage of hatchlings make it back to the breeding ground in Florida? You had to do a little bit of math here. Um, so <clears throat> you probably heard that only one in 4,000, so sad, um, only one in 4,000 uh, hatchlings actually make it back to Florida and one in 4,000, if your math is correct, is 0.025%. Poor little guys. Um, <clears throat> I wish more of those loggerhead turtles would make it back. But uh, yeah, it's, it's 0 0.25, point, sorry, 0.025%, okay? One over 4,000 is 0.025%. Sad but true, okay? So the correct answer for this one is A. All right, that was part four. 
Okay, everyone. Um, great job on the listening today and yesterday. Uh, how did you do? What did you get out of 40? Let me um, show you where you can check your mark. If you go to our websites and you go to the bottom, you'll find this uh, score calculator on the website. Okay, there's that score calculator and you can get on that score calculator and then you'll find this kind of layout here where you can enter your band score. So those students who were in this class uh, yesterday and today, what did you get? So Saswati says 34. So 34 would be 7.5 Saswati. Ashish got 38. That's 8.5. A nine is either 39 or 40, okay? Uh, Rashika says 33. That's a 7.5, Rashika. That's quite good, okay? Nanda says 37. That's great. Just breathe. 36. That's an eight. Okay, very good. All right. Araf says 15 and 18. So you did better today, Araf. That's not bad at all. Okay, Araf says 33. 33 is still a 7.5, which is fantastic. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, that's uh, it for listening. Make sure to practice lots before your test so that you are familiar with the format especially. And you can go to our website, gltelp.com. Join our premium package. It's a one-time payment, lifetime access. doesn't cost very much. Uh, just click that big red button and you'll get six full practice exams originals with listening. It's exactly like Cambridge and the IELTS in difficulty and format. Um, and then uh, for academic, go to aehelp.com. And for more live lessons, uh, come back this time tomorrow. We will be doing a speaking part three questions and answers practice. Members will finish up task two tomorrow in the class beforehand. Um, again, lots more at aehelp.com and gltelp.com. Visit us there. Fantastic job today, students. Keep it up. All right? And have a great weekend. Much love to wherever you are in the world. I'm Adrian, and I'm signing out from beautiful Victoria for now. Catch you all tomorrow. Bye.